good morning good morning everybody uh, welcome to this uh, online session this webinar uh, on human security in, in the times of uh, covid we are very happy uh, to offer you this session uh, we together uh, CIDOP uh, and eBay has uh, joined a force uh, to collaborate and to organize this uh, this session that hope will you will enjoy it's a topic that is uh, uh, of utmost importance uh, in our times because the COVID is creating uh, a lot of uh, new tensions or is uh, reshaping uh, all, all tensions as well. And we have uh, with us uh, Professor Mary Calder from uh, London School of Economics, uh, who is going to provide uh, the talk on this topic. And we also be commented by uh, uh, researchers from our institutions, uh, Martin uh, Blaskam, uh, from uh, eBay, the Warsaw Institute of International Studies, and uh, Paul Borges uh, from uh, CIDOP, the Barcelona uh, Center for International Affairs. So, I think, uh, I hope that you will enjoy this uh, discussion and the session uh, after the, the comments uh, of uh, our researchers. Uh, we will open also for, for uh, questions and comments from the general audience uh, using the, our, our chat system in this uh, platform. So I pass uh, the word to uh, Paul Morillas, uh, director of uh, CLOP, who is going to introduce uh, Professor uh, Mary Caldor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justine. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to uh, jointly uh, organize this, uh, this session on, uh, on the challenges that, that, uh, that COVID is generating for human security, but also beyond. Um, and also to have the opportunity to, to, to reinforce our partnership in, in, in events such as this one um, by merging uh, voices of, of, of relevant speakers that um, are uh, very knowledgeable about the topics that we are uh, going to discuss. Of course, uh, today we have the honor to have uh, with us uh, Mary Caldor. Mary Caldor, um, she's a professor at the London School of Economics, the director of the Conflict and Civil Society Research Unit at the Department of International Development. But I would say that Mary Caldor is also a very good friend of Barcelona. She's been involved uh, both with um, eBay and, and CIDOP on, on several occasions. I uh, remember very well and, and very vividly the times that she convened a group of um, high-level researchers uh, at the request of Javier Solana, then a high representative for the Union's, European Union's foreign policy, uh, to precisely discuss to what extent the concept of human security um, could be uh, the, at the, the backbone of uh, Europe's foreign policy. Um, under her leadership, there was an influential report called the Human Security, uh, a Human Security Doctrine for Europe, uh, launched at the time, uh, widely discussed not only between academic uh, spheres and think tank policy spheres, but also very much in the uh, policy area, in the, in the highest areas of policy developments, particularly at the European Union level, but also at the member states level. Um, that was a very uh, important moment for the implementation of the doctrine of the human security. Many years have elapsed since many things have happened at the at the international level, uh, not also not only as a, as a consequence uh, of um, the, the, the geopolitical developments that we've seen from those early two thousands until today. The European Union has also uh, changed quite dramatically. The foreign policy of the European Union has changed quite dramatically. But today, our ambition is to discuss to what extent the human security principles are still valid, are still interesting to uh, a particular reading of international affairs and particularly after uh, the pandemic and the outbreak of the pandemic. So without further ado, it's a, a real pleasure uh, from CIDOP to have the opportunity to host you. Professor Calder, the floor is yours. Uh, you will be followed, as the scene was mentioned, by comments from our uh, researchers, and then we will open it up to the discussion uh, questions that might come to us through our YouTube platform, where this uh, uh, event is being broadcasted. So, uh, Professor Mary Calder, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being here. 
Well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me, and I hope in some better times we'll all be able to meet again in Barcelona, but at least we can meet over Zoom, which is very much to do with the times we live in. Um, in the UK, twice as many people have died in, uh, from COVID-19 as died in the Blitz during the Second World War. Every day in the United States, more people, at least at the moment, more people die from COVID than died on 9-11. COVID has transformed the way we live and hugely damaged livelihoods. It's changed the way we think about government as well. Uh, it's taken for granted nowadays, and we see it on television and on radio, that governments have to take responsibility for the well-being of their citizens. Uh, that's even true in China, even though human rights abuses, of course, continue. But even so, there's a general sense that meant that being responsible for the health of your citizens is one of the tasks of government. And it wasn't always so. This is really what we mean by human security. The heroes and heroines of this crisis are actually health workers and care workers and not soldiers, even though soldiers seem to be helping with testing, vaccinations and all sorts of non-military tasks. This is an existential crisis akin to a war. And in the past, major wars have been moments of huge social and political transformation. So the question that I want to ask in this lecture is, could COVID represent a similar moment? Could it usher in a moment of social and political transformation? It's a huge question. So I'm only just going to touch on elements of it, but I hope we can start a discussion. COVID could be considered what Gramsci called a morbid symptom, at least the incompetence uh, of governments like my own or the American government in dealing with COVID. Uh, and what Gramsci meant was these are the things that appear when the old is dying and the new cannot be born. The old is the old paradigm, if you like, model of development dominated by the United States, very statist and, if you like, blockist, involving mass production, the intensive use of fossil fuels, uh, the intensive use of oil in particular, mass consumption and also militarism. I think the new, or, although we don't really know what the new is, will have to be both local, regional and global and not just national. Um, it will be resource saving, green. It will make a lot of use of information and communications technology. Uh, and above all, because this is the, my focus, it will mean a global commitment to human security rather than national security. COVID has already brought about some major changes, though it's not at all clear whether they are sustainable. I think first and foremost, it seems to mark the end of austerity, the end of a long period of neoliberalism. I do believe that neoliberalism was a response to the failure of the old paradigm uh, that was already exhausted in the 1970s. Uh, and it was a response that came from both right and left to the rigidity of the state and the difficulty of change. Uh, what we're seeing is much greater borrowing. We're seeing this huge European recovery plan, uh, much greater spending by governments everywhere. The question is, is it sustainable? And it's only going to be sustainable if we really restructure debt for poor countries. And if we think of new forms of taxation, whether multinational corporations or carbon or whatever. So that's the first big change. Secondly, of course, we've had an enormous reduction in travel. 
which also has resulted in a reduction in carbon emissions, though not as much as we would like. Um, and it's the effect of home working has brought many people closer to nature and more conscious of climate change. Thirdly, uh, it is, has involved a much more intensive use of information and communications technology, the use of internet in all fields of activity, Zoom, Teams, what we're doing today. Uh, and although sometimes it's quite difficult and quite tiring, it also has great advantages in that it reduces travel, but also allows us to be much more connected. It allows us to have transnational meetings like today. Uh, fourthly, I think it will, it is involving a change in the pattern of consumption. There is a drop in private consumption and more emphasis on health, education and care. And finally, I think, it, in principle at least, it involves a shift to the global and the local. The global, because although it's not necessarily happening when you see the competition for vaccines, we need a pan-global response because it's not only because of justice reasons, not only to help poorer countries, but because we can't actually eliminate the disease without a global response. But at the same time, what we've learned is that the response has to be community-based, that it has to be local. Things like test and trace really only work at a local level. Uh, I read a fascinating article about why Africa has experienced less COVID than elsewhere. And there are obvious explanations, uh, the climate and the fact that Africans are thinner and younger than Europeans. Nevertheless, one explanation was that because of Ebola and because of AIDS, Africans have developed more effective local community healthcare systems. So are all these changes sustainable? Could they come together to be a paradigm or will we revert to normal when COVID is over um, and it will be a worse normal, I think, if we do that? So in the rest of the lecture, in what follows, I want to start by talking about the kind of changes that in the past have been brought about by war and the kind of changes that are being brought about by contemporary wars. Then I want to talk about the rise of populist authoritarianism, which is the biggest obstacle to making this sustainable. Uh, and finally, I will talk a little, not as much as maybe I'd promised, uh, about why a shift to human security is so critical to make everything else happen. So let me start. Oh, God, I don't know what I forgot to. Uh, this, was my, this was illustrating my last, what I said before. I'm so sorry, I forgot to. And it, now I will turn to the next one. So let's start with the changes brought about by, ma by major interstate war. Um, First of all, um, and, and the kind of wars that I'm thinking about are the Napoleonic Wars at the end of the 18th century, at to the beginning of the 19th century. I'm thinking of the mid 19th century wars like the Austro Prussian War, the American Civil War, the Crimean War, the Franco Prussian War. And I'm thinking about the two world wars in the 20th century. So what these were major transformative wars fought between states with regular armed forces. And what were the sort of changes they brought about? Well, the first is hugely important. Uh, they, they really changed the nature of the state. And many of you will be familiar with the work of Charles Tilley, who famous statement, war made the state and the state made war. So when monarchs went to war, they had to find the money, they had to increase taxation, make it more, make tax collection more efficient. They had to uh, 
increased borrowing, so they had to establish central banks. Um, they had to provide improved domestic security. Otherwise, people gave their money not to the government, but to pirates and highwaymen. Um, and in return, and they had to recruit people as soldiers, and in return, you got an extension of rights. Uh, civil rights in the Napoleonic Wars, which brought about big changes in constitutions across Europe. In the middle century wars, we got the unification of Germany uh, and France and Germany and Italy and the uh, uh, end of slavery in the South in America, all of which led to a increased democracy, if you like, political rights. And in the 20th century, you got a much greater state role in the beginnings of economic and social rights, the welfare state. So that's the first big change. The second was, and I think this is equally important, and it's usually the first is given much more emphasis, but the nation state was only possible within a global international system where there were shared rules, something I fear the conservatives in my own country simply don't understand. Um, so each of these major wars established a regulatory framework in which trade and capitalism and travel all became possible. Um, for the Napoleonic Wars was critical in establishing British hegemony uh, the British Empire was extended during the wars and trade hugely increased for the Brit for the UK during the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, it also established the concept of Europe, which kept Europe peaceful until the middle century. The mid-century wars established, led to the scramble of for colonies and also the what's known as the Bismarckian concept. And finally, the 20th century wars established American hegemony, uh, decolonization, the establishment of the European Union and the UN as new multilateral institutions, and the Cold War as a sort of geopolitical framework. So that's the second. The third has to do with technology. Each of these wars boosted the technology associated with the model of development. So for the Napoleonic War, it was textiles. British cotton exports hugely increased. And of course, one of the factors was, math, was conscription in which soldiers for the first time wore uniforms. Napoleon's army marched to Moscow in British boots. Um, in the mid-century wars, it was the railway and the telegraph. Uh, Italians said it's the railway which will stitch up the boot of Italy. And of course, in the 20th century wars, it was oil and mass production. And then finally, the wars brought about changes. They, they constructed identity. National identities were constructed in wars. Um, Benedict talks about the imagined nature of national identity. Well, it was in wars that, for instance, in the English Civil Wars, newspapers first appeared, that it was in wars that national identity was imagined in a much more serious way. Um, and of course, after the mid 20th century wars, it was ideological uh, um, identity. For the West, it was democracy versus totalitarianism. For the Soviet bloc, it was socialism versus capitalism. Now, those kinds of wars, they brought about big transformation, but they were also hugely destructive. The mind boggles when thinking about the Second World War, something like 70 million people were killed during the Second World War. And so that kind of war is really unthinkable today. I think it would literally mean the end of the world, but it doesn't mean we've ended wars. And of course, contemporary wars are very, very different. 
I don't want to go into the whole issue of what contemporary wars are like, but what I do want to say is that they also bring about social and political transformation, but, but very different from the political and social transformation brought about by classic interstate wars. And what do they bring about? Well, first of all, they lead to state fragmentation or the disassembly of the state, to use a phrase of Saskia Sassin. Um, and we can see that in Syria, in the Balkans, everywhere, an uneasy set of new entities in the Transcaucasus gets created. Uh, they're both global and local. Um, Actually, the networks are very global, the networks of identity that are uh, in these wars, but also there's usually a global and multilateral presence in these wars. So they're global and local. Um, they use technology, but in very negative ways. Um, the Russians talk about political technology. They also call contemporary wars non-linear wars. And what they mean by political technology is the kind of uh, interference on social media that we observed in the Trump elections of 2016 and the Brexit vote that still continue, the hackers, all these, these armies of uh, people who spread fake news, support extremist politics. I think also what I've tended to call vernacular military technology, which means that in new wars, small armed groups can cause a huge amount of damage, um, or if you like, terrorists can. They use, it's vernacular in the sense if you take something like an improvised explosive device, an IED, you use ingredients like detergents or uh, uh, fertilizers, but you combine them with mobile phones to provide sophisticated triggering devices. And finally, of course, they involve fragmentary and exclusive identities, Shia versus Sunni, Serb versus Croat, and so on. Um, I sort of would describe, and I'll come back to that in a minute, these wars as an extreme version of neoliberalism. Um, and they create a new kind of social condition that makes them very, very difficult to end. All the wars we observe now seem to have gone on and on and on, Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq, for years and years and years. So, you know, one question to ask ourselves is, are these just an aberration or could they be pointing to a different future, not the sort of lovely new paradigm I was talking about, but a rather nasty paradigm. Um, which brings me, I mean, I think the to understand and think about this question, we really need to think about the rise of populist authoritarianism. I want to emphasize that this is a structural phenomenon. I'm thinking of Donald Trump in America, I'm thinking of Bolsonaro in Brazil, I'm thinking of Modi in India, I'm thinking of Viktor Orban in Hungary, I'm thinking of Boris Johnson in the UK. It's a structural phenomenon because they all have very similar features. And what are those similar features? Well, they're a mixture of what I would call extremist identity politics, ethnic nationalism, religious fundamentalism, um, and they are ideologies that are very extremely gendered. They always involve a form of toxic masculinity. Um, and this is combined with a sort of crony capitalism. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that in a minute. I think it also represents a morbid symptoms, a sign of the times. We get these kind of weird populists in all of the previous periods that led up to major interstate wars, whether you're talking about Hitler, Stalin, they were different from the contemporary, but they nevertheless made use of these racist 
and nationalist um, ideologies. And I think we can argue that they are the consequence of four decades of neoliberalism, which, as I said before, was itself a consequence of the exhaustion of the American model of development in the 1970s. So what did neoliberalism lead to? Well, I think, first of all, especially after the 2008 financial crisis, it's led to extremes of inequality. It, neoliberalism produced this phenomenon from bo both below and above. So if we think about the below bit, it led to extremes of inequalities. It led to large areas that were, in the jargon, left behind. Or a, a colleague of mine talks about them as the places that don't matter. In the UK, I'm thinking of the red wall seats. In America, I'm thinking of the rust belt seats, where anger, frustration, disempowerment uh, has led to have have made people very vulnerable to ideologies based on the other, on scapegoating immigrants, scapegoating blacks, women, and so on. It brings out things that people maybe thought before privately but knew you couldn't say. From above, I think it's the rise of what I would call raunchy states. The huge growth of finance vis-a-vis -vis manufacturing has meant that governments are increasingly dependent on rents rather than taxation, and that sort of breaks the relationship with their citizens. I think also particularly important has been the contracting out culture and the privatization of state enterprises, which has created a whole new class of oligarchs or cronies who are dependent on state contracts. And it creates this very frightening, cozy relationship in which the oligarchs and cronies finance the campaigns of the populist authoritarians and then gets their payback. In the UK, just to give you an example, the test and trace system has been entirely contracted out to companies who supported the Brexit campaign. Um, and not surprisingly, this is really a major explanation for why it's been so completely and utterly incompetent. Uh, my colleague, Alex DeWall, who, with whom I work on conflict, calls these kinds of systems political marketplaces. Now, what does COVID mean for these kinds of leaders? Well, I think COVID does weaken legitimacy. We are coming face to face with reality and incompetence does matter. And, you know, the first example of this loss of legitimacy is the victory of Biden in the United States. But as we know, Biden hasn't defeated the phenomenon of Trumpism and quite frightening things are happening in the United States. So my fear is that this could lead to increasing violence and this combination of extremist identity politics and the political marketplace is what we observe in the new wars, uh, whether we're talking about Syria, Libya, Congo. So that's quite a frightening scenario. Um, if, so what is the alternative? And this is where I finally come rather briefly to human security. Um, I think for the new paradigm, we need to move away uh, from the state to multi-level governments. Um, and the new paradigm needs both needs global, regional, local, and less state regulation. Um, and I think absolutely key to the legitimacy and the strength of political authorities is security policy. Fundamentally, we trust our institutions if we believe they keep us safe. Um, and the problem with the state is that embedded in the state, partly because of the way the state was created, is the link to war. Again, to take an example for my own country, the middle of COVID, 
uh, there's a big increase in military spending and a big cut in overseas aid at a time when just the opposite is required. So what do we mean by human security? Most people are familiar with the term, but it's human security is about the security of individuals and communities rather than states. And it's about material as well as physical security. It's about being able to, it's about poverty and deprivation as well as about being robbed, looted or killed. And human security is adopted both at local levels and at regional or global levels. So at local levels, or, or potentially adopted, not necessarily already, at local levels, we see a type of civic security based on policing, uh, healthcare, and so on. And at regional and global levels, the EU and the United Nations they're moving towards, quite explicitly, something we might call human security. What actually does human security mean at a global level? Well, I think what it need, means is that it's all about the alternative to new wars. It's about needing to dampen down new wars and indeed to prevent new wars in places where populist authoritarians exist. What we see in the new wars is that the conventional geopolitical approaches that have come to the rise in the last decade make things worse. Something like 75 countries have intervened in Syria and the Syrian conflict has been much more deadly than any other because what was absent was the United Nations and indeed the European Union presence. Military interventions make things worse. The other conventional approach, which I won't discuss at length, is top-down negotiations. They tend to, they're very difficult to reach and they tend to entrench the actors uh, of new wars. And humanitarian assistance of a classic kind doesn't work because it kind of feeds in to crony capitalism and makes it worse. So actually, I think what human security has to do, and for time reasons, I'm not going to say how it does it, um, we need to address the structural basis of new wars, namely the political marketplace, identity politics, and toxic masculinity. We need to establish new forms of legitimate authority that provide legitimate livelihoods, that are based on taxation uh, rather than rent. Um, now, just to finish, because I've been very brief on this last bit, I just wanted to say that the European Union in its global strategy did adopt a human security approach to conflicts, but actually the global strategy needs to be implemented. The EU doesn't act politically in most of the conflicts that we talk about. It does things at local levels that are quite useful, but it needs to become a much more significant actor in global affairs. And I do think that would be absolutely key to the adoption of human security and to trying to um, address the rise and spread of populist authoritarianism linked to a kind of very dangerous and old-fashioned geopolitics. Um, and so I suppose my final message is, um, can this new move brought about by COVID, and it is a new move, lead to a greater emphasis on how we deal with conflicts in the world and prevent the emergence of conflicts in all sorts of places near home. Thank you. Sorry, I was I was on mute. This is something that happens very regularly in this uh, in these shows. So thank you very much for your for your very uh, interesting uh, introduction. 
um, to the topic. I will now give the floor immediately to um, uh, our uh, two researchers that have uh, been working on, on, on similar topics to provide their views. So uh, Martin Blas come from IVE and Paul Varghese from, from CIDOP. Martin, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, hello. Thank you very much, first of all, Professor Kelder, for your uh, very insightful comments. So what I want to do um, in the minutes, um, in the following minutes, is to talk a little bit about um, the implications of the coronavirus on human security based on your um, uh, presentation. So I want to structure this first looking very quickly on a geopolitical level, then a little more on the state, at least the Western state level, and finally on those states um, that are probably most um, likely to experience new wars or already experiencing new wars. Okay. So 2020 has been uh, called uh, the worst year ever by Time Magazine just recently. Um, so this <laughs> would indicate a paradigm shift. Um, I'm personally not so sure if this is a completely uh, adequate um, qualification, I, but I think it's rather it has accelerated many um, already existing developments on these uh, three different levels. Um, so to start with that, a geopolitical level is of course um, what some people argue, well, this um, the weak response of the Western states is kind of the final nail in the coffin of the Western system, um, and the Western values, um, the ability of China to at least uh, project the idea that they've been more um, effective in ending um, uh, the corona crisis, and they are, of course, they're quite um, clear about this, I mean, broadcasting these images uh, when people want already going back to swimming pool while the West is still in, in in lockdown mode. So we see then something which was already going on before that um, China is um, much more getting an international actor. Um, so um, that they therefore also try to create and um, project more soft power. And um, I'm not sure if this is something which is really in favor of um, a Western model of human security, since China also has a very different understanding of human security, much more focused really on basic stability. Um, a less this broad understanding of um, of the European Union in particular, but also other um, Western actors. So I think this is already something um, to take into account on how the corona crisis could um, influence uh, human security in, in the midterm in all around the world, and especially in, a, in the global south. Okay. I mean, again, this is not something which has started just because of the corona crisis. We have already seen the um, pivot to Asia of the United States, the EU returned to politics before that. But um, now it has become more evident. No? Then, on the more state level, um, as you already mentioned, of course, this uh, rise of authoritarian um, populism was also developed, and it started already before this. Um, also, as a result of the increasing divisions between um, winners and losers of globalization. Um, if you look at U.S. elections, for example. Um, the most uh, hit areas by globalization uh, voted um, uh, President Trump in um, 2016. And actually, quite interestingly, um, in this 2020 elections, those areas that benefited most economically during the um, Trump um, administration were those that shifted most to Biden, whereas that had suffered most economically during the Trump administration shifted more to Trump. So. Um, um, there's this more, and the explanation, of course, that this generalist economic globalization um, benefits um, yeah, certain groups much more than others. So the zero corona um, virus crisis hit many societies, um, which were already in political terms, in economic terms, in social terms, very fractured at the very beginning, and um, were therefore also um, prone to um, these systems of uh, this. Um, authoritarian populism you mentioned and with all its um, implications. So I think the particular thing then about COVID-19 is, especially at the beginning, was the perception that really the security issues affects everyone in the same way. Okay, so I mean, right now we know that's not the case. Um, well, it is in terms of, uh, of course, in terms of health, previous health conditions, but we've also seen that um, groups that are already um, socially, economically weaker are much more hit by this um, crisis. That, for example, a woman are much more hit um, by the economic consequences of this. But of the, from the very beginning, was really um, framed or perceived as a, an issue of um, yeah, almost national security in a classical sense. And if we go back and look at some of the quotes, like by Macron when he was talking, when he was using this very warlike um, metaphors, um, it was really seen as a as a war thing. No? 
So it was, I think, I think in this sense, interesting because it was really some a collective um, a threat perception, ones you probably have not seen for such a long time. To some extent, perhaps terrorism, but even terrorism, if you live in a small village town in the Pyrenees Mountains, the chance that the Islamic State will attack you is rather, <laughs> rather small, whereas the virus, of course, has expanded oh, even to the smallest places since then. So it's really the idea that this is. Uh, it's really a security threat or a human security threat for yourself. And as a result, people have increasingly um, looked back to the state for protection. So I think this entire crisis really has um, increased um, the, the desire by many citizens um, that the state does idea that the state should provide the security. There has been surprisingly um, least, uh, less re little resistance to all these um, well, it's pretty radical measures, you know, like uh, these lockdowns or um, uh, these limitations to the freedom of movement things. Um, but of course, um, yeah, many civil liberties were stopped. And I think to some extent, this crisis has also then shown these measures, the limitations of a more liberal approach to these issues exactly because it's a collective um, security threat. You know? So we have seen some countries that um, build much more on um, on, uh, they trusted much more the citizens, so to speak, that they would um, um, operate in, in a reasonable way, like, um, like the Netherlands, for example, initially, well, they've changed course quite dramatically since then. Sweden, um, even they have changed a little bit. United States, of course, in all these states fared much worse than their um, peers, comparable countries around them, that took much, where the state took a much more um, strong line, okay? So this, of course, sabotage has many underpinnings of um, of liberalism, so the idea that people would um, act responsible um, if you let them go, but it also um, gives much more strength again to the idea of the state and um, this, also the security is really something national. If you really see these differences between countries, so I mean, the first reaction that people turned to was to close the border and to protect yourself, and we see now again also these protectionism of our scenes. So security is much more seen as something uh, national again. Um, as a result of the corona crisis and the state is much more seen again as a provider of security as it was perhaps um, before so um, i think if anything to sum this up the section i think that the corona crisis actually strengthened the position of the state as a provider of security and actually also increased a certain form of um, economic nationalism or perceptions that's really um the state should take care of this and also decrease the more the, the global dimension of this. I'm not sure that, but I don't think that many people, are, if you also read in the newspapers in Spain and elsewhere, are not particularly concerned how the um, corona crisis is going um, in, around the world. You know, it's much more focused on your own security demands. And then finally, on to look a little bit on countries um, that are anywhere ready at risk of um, new wars, as you, um, you call them. Well, we have some data about this, of course, and actually in the first months, um, the ECLA data at least shows that there's been a decrease of uh, violence, um, of civil war violence, of less violent protests. Um, there have been some ceasefires, um, so that would be good news, actually. But I think that um, this is actually more calm before the storm, because what we, almost all the parameters that are moving now um, are increasing the likelihood of armed conflicts. We see that states are, are getting weaker due to the economic output. Um, for example, that states which depend on natural resource exports, um, their revenues have, um, went um, down dramatically, of course, due to the price crisis, or countries in general which depend on trade or on tourism, they have less money to spend. And um, this affects, of course, the political marketplace you just mentioned. If the, the gravy train stops, so to speak, and there's less money to spend, well, then it will also be more rivalry even for the little money that's spent, and that can also lead then um, to violent confrontation. So this is one thing that increases the likelihood of conflict. Mm. Another one is, of course, um, as you also mentioned, um, what the ethnic divisions, um, I mean, it's very common in um, these health crisis that people start the blame game, um, that maybe other social groups and maybe other ethnic groups. Um, I mean, um, this is not something only of um, countries in Africa or Asia or Latin America. I mean, in Europe, it's, it's the same. It has been all during all history like this. If you, um, that man, uh, other groups were um, seen guilty as the, uh, as the blame was sent to them. So, but this can also contribute to increased um, ethnic tensions in these countries. 
Um, and finally, uh, very often, as you also mentioned, the answer then can be some, some strong man um, that represents this um, toxic masculinity also in these places that uh, um, if there's any fragile democracy, that some actors think that now what you really need is the, um, the strong man who um, ends all these um, ambiguity and solves and has easy fixes for this problem and more this can increase then the probability of coup d'etat and similar things. I mean, in general, we know that coup d'etats are much more likely in um, in more moments of um, instability and insecurity. No? So um, to sum up, I think that I'm a pretty gloom out view. <laughs> so um, I like your argument, your, this, um, your, your proposals. Um, but I'm personally, I'm, I think it will be very hard to um, realize right now because almost all parameters are moving into a negative direction. No? The, the, um, we see the broader geopolitical trends that move away from a more Western idea of human security, um, at least in terms of pure power politics, I would say. Um, we see that the uh, state is much more, becomes much more a crucial player in um, in terms of uh, provider security and we've seen much less this more global um, dimension also this involvement of, of local actor or different ent entities um, and yeah most essentially i would say um, we see um, that many of the uh, more economic effects um, and also social effects of the um, corona crisis um, increase the likelihood of conflicts in countries which are anyway very fragile so um, I'm not sure if the, mm, this um, corona crisis will really change that much um, the concept of security. I mean, the other day I actually heard, just to conclude, I read an interview with an, um, invest, an uh, medical researcher, and he said that apparently it's theoretically possible to already create some kind of um, prototype vaccines for all those um, viruses which are um, they expect to that they could possibly cause a pandemic. And he said, well, it's actually not that expensive, it's more or less the price of an um, army um, fighter jet. Um, so to conclude, the, the moment you, um, I see states really cut on a <laughs> fighter jet to invest in, in this, then I think that we really have moved from a, a traditional national security um, concept um, to a new concept where we really put health at the center. But uh, hope, let's hope that it works this way. Thank you. Um, thank you, Martin. Uh, and now the, the turn is for uh, Paul Varghese. Thank you, Paul, uh, for giving me the opportunity to, to react to this uh, wonderful presentation by Mary Calder on how we should value human security in times of uh, pandemic. Human security as an idea represents this move away from traditional understandings of security that put the state at, at the center that value national security. Human security recognizes the complex nature of contemporary wars, the fact that wars are diffused, that they tend towards uh, protractedness, that they are complex, that they are about groups that mobilize around identity, groups that are greedy, that do not want to win, but rather to continue the war. Um, because they benefit from this war. They seek to destabilize the state rather than creating, um, create a state or spill the state. The problem of traditional views of se on security or populist views on security is that they fail to see these, these changes in, in contemporary wars. And instead human security as, as this idea, as this alternative, um, encourage us to see or to pursue comprehensive strategies uh, to achieve human security or security at the community at the local level. And, and this is why, why Mary Calder has rightly pointed out to us that we need comprehensive strategies, multi-level governance to attend this security and to pursue a global commitment, cooperation across borders, in which conglomerate of uh, state and non-state actors can, can provide uh, a sense of security to, to people. Well, this, this idea that I have tried to summarize here, what I find interesting is that when contrasted with two observations made, made during the last, the last year during the response to the pandemic, I, 
I think we see some tension in this in this human security uh, framework. The first the first observation is that the response to the pandemic has been not so much about human security, but a way more individualistic response where life has been reduced to a matter of survival. Uh, well, usually the, the focus on, on media has been on, on the free riders who have not followed the restriction measures imposed by governments, so the teenagers who have partied, or people who have escaped the perimeter confinements. It is important to focus on, on all the others, those who have had a judgmental attitude towards the free riders, who have legitimized the fines imposed by the police, who have legitimized the restrictions made by government, governments. What has dominated is the ethics of precaution, where it is very important to be, to be extremely cautious about any contact that we may have. The ethics of precaution encourage us to, be, to panic early, to be very careful, very prudent, to avoid gatherings. While human security, in theory, it is said that it is about freedom from fear, removing barriers, removing threats. In the ethics of precaution, in the ethics responding to coronavirus, the lesson has been panic early. So humans these days are not humans, but a possible source of danger, bodies that contain viruses. People cannot be trusted. The recommendation is to stay at home and work from home. You might say, well, this is, this is, is a new form of solidarity. Um, the solidarity is because it's to, to distance oneself, to avoid contagion. Solidarity is expressed these days by being alone. But I think this is a telling paradox that I would like to ask you, Mary Calder, what do you think about? In the human security, in, as the idea that you, have, you and others have put forward, security is more than just survival. It is a coming together. It is solidarity. It is people who trust each other. Today, security is about avoid uh, seeing each other is about avoid avoiding contacts is about staying at home work from home so I think that I would like you to ask for this this tension that I have I have observed these days and there is a second observation which I think is a bit different to what uh, what Martin was suggesting about how the crisis have reinforced the power of the states I think is I think it's is a bit the opposite. The crisis, we have seen how states are, are very vulnerable, at least in Europe, incapable of responding to, to the crisis. We have seen in the pandemic how European states have been weak in responding. They have been incapable of producing masks or tests or doing proper contact tracing when needed. It is possible that human security is an idea which so convincingly has criticized the idea of state centrism or national security is indirectly contributing to this decapacitation of the states. You might say, well, it's neoliberalism the problem here, the, the, which has neoliberalism has made the states weak. And I would agree, but human security has celebrated the erosion of the power of these states. Now, in 2020, we realize that when Europeans most need their, their states to coordinate efficient responses, the less capable these states uh, have become. And this was my, my second observation on this decapacitation of the states that human security might have contributed. That the, the second question that I would like you to, to ask. And thank you. On, on, on the, on the problematization of, of, of human security. I would, uh, before I give the floor to Jacin, maybe he also has a, a question. I would like to, to mention a third uh, element uh, besides what uh, Paul was mentioning and taking it from where Martin also uh, brought it. And it's the narrative of the European Union today to be a more geopolitical actor precisely at the time when 
um, when a big power rivalry is uh, gaining strength. We saw that during the pandemic, but of course before as well between the US and China, and very likely uh, for many authors saying that the 21st century will be about this, uh, about the, 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 the decadence of uh, the US as, as, the, as the main power, the rise of China and the consolidation of China and the instability that unfolds from many perspectives on these changing uh, patterns of power at the global, at the global level. Well, at this very moment, the, Euro the European Union is also adopting some uh, narrative that uh, seconds this uh, view on global politics based on the return of geopolitics and uh, with all the discussion on uh, strategic autonomy, the capacity to act uh, by itself when, when needed, uh, and, and, and uh, the, capacity, the capacity to develop its own, its own uh, tools for action along those lines, um, perhaps makes the European Union shift away from these more human security-centered approaches or contribution to international security that it has always um, um, put at the forefront, right? And 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 the, the question is: to what extent can the European Union, with its uh, its uh, its narrative turn and with this narrative turn, can it still uphold the the values that, of course, are at the backbone of of, of its uh, conception of security, right? And 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 this is a third contradiction or a third element that I think that the, the pandemic has uh, put forward, but also the current leadership at the at the EU level that makes out of this geopolitical logic and this, uh, this uh, um, need to play uh, stronger in, in power politics makes it uh, question some of the premises that we, that we have been discussing for, for so far. Um, Jacin, maybe you would like to also uh, raise a question um, and then I will give Mary Calder the opportunity to, to respond to the different remarks that have been made, uh, both by Maritime and Paul. Um, so Jacin. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mary, and also thank you, Matthias and Paul, for, for your comments. And yeah, I have a, a question, but it's also a very general question regarding the, the global governance of security and the, the impact of the pandemic. Whether to whether I would like to know your impression, whether you see some signs or some directions in which uh, uh, the, the, the impact of, uh, of COVID and, uh, I would say, the uh, health security is uh, challenging some of the traditions or standards of the traditional security and in this sense uh, putting more strongly on the on the global governance agenda issues of uh, human security so this is was thinking how we can relate to these recent developments to the, the topic you were uh, presenting well it's uh, mary uh, the floor is you if you want to address the these uh, issues and, and comments. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the comment <laughs> because they were really interesting. <clears throat> and um, I, I want to start with Martin's comments, obviously, um, about did it, and I agree with Paul rather than Martin, about did it strengthen the state? It certainly people expect the state to act. That certainly was strengthened. We all expected the state to act, but actually the state was very inadequate in acting. And that's why I say, um, I'm not sure, I think this may not necessarily lead to a strengthening of the state. It would have led had the state been really efficient, but actually the state was incompetent. And not only was it incompetent, but actually this is a global problem. We cannot unilaterally solve the problem of COVID. COVID is something that will come back and back again unless we solve it globally. So first of all, I think the state can't. But secondly, if you look at what's actually happened, you do see, I mean, I see it particularly in the UK, uh, the response of the different uh, regions, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland has been completely different. There's been a real demand for devolution of power, a real demand for increased localism with mayors taking very strong political positions. 
So that's so you know my feeling is that if the national if it does succeed in strengthening the national state, then it also will succeed in a very producing a very pessimistic scenario, which I think Martin thinks too. Um, and linked to that, of course, is what he was saying about armed conflicts. What concerns me is actually that the problem is that COVID, you know, I, I run a big conflict research program. And of course, we've looked at COVID in all our um, conflict areas. And it's had devastating consequences because health systems are inadequate or non-existent. Um, there are people can't stay at home because they're in refugee camps or detention camps, which are um, places where COVID spreads very rapidly. Um, and uh, um, it's had devastating economic consequence. Somewhere like Somalia, the remittances have just dropped dramatically on which people survive. And so I think actually one of the things to say to ourselves is COVID actually, in reality, whether it does in our perceptions, makes us realize that it's terribly important to address conflicts, just as it makes us realize it's very important to address inequality, because it's inequality and it's conflicts uh, that speed up the transmission of conflicts. Um, the other issue is this issue of us being more liberal. I find that a really argument I don't like at all. Boris Johnson made that argument. He said, oh, we can't, you know, British people are so free, unlike Italians. We fought for freedom, so we're never going to obey rules. My experience is that everybody has taken rules very seriously, and if the uh, impact of COVID has not been um, as bad as it might have been given the response of the government. That is because people obeyed the rules. I think the huge problem has been the complete absence of a test and trace system, the inadequacy of protective equipment, which all has to do with the incompetence of our governments. And if we look at the places that have dealt rather well with COVID. Of course, a lot of people point to China and say it's surveillance, but actually South Korea and Taiwan have managed it equally well. So why did Asia do so much better? And I think one reason is greater equality, that fewer people die because there are fewer extremely poor people. But another reason is very efficient test and trace systems, very efficient protective equipment, all of which is partly because they're developing it within the framework of a new paradigm, uh, and also because they'd already had the experience of SARS and were much better prepared than we were. So I'm really skeptical of this argument that we in Europe are too liberal. And that brings me to some of Paul's arguments, which are very interesting about solidarity. I'm being very struck in this pandemic, actually, by the degree to which, I mean, it may be true that we're forced to be individual, but the degree to which neighbours and um, neighbours and local people are looking out for everyone, the degree, the, the way in which community organisations have sprung up to deal with old people. I'm an old person and I get little messages through my door saying, please ring this number if you would like help or support. Um, so actually I'm not convinced that it's true that this is bad for solidarity. I, I, um, the jury is out and we will see, but actually I think not only have, have there been, has there been a lot of civil society activity during this pandemic, not only about the pandemic, but I'm thinking of movements like Black Lives Matter or what's happening in Belarus or what's happening in Poland. Um, there have been movements against populist authoritarianism, so I'm not completely convinced of the tension with solidarity. Um, 
And finally, I think this question about Europe as a geopolitical actor is an incredibly interesting question. Um, it seems to me that populist authoritarians automatically pursue internationally a sort of weird geopolitical strategy. You know, they make a lot of the competition between, for example, the United States and China. Um, but it's not a sort of classic, it's much more in the imagination and it's much more linked to political technology. I think it's a completely counterproductive um, strategy that can't lead anywhere. And so it makes me nervous when the Europe starts talking about it being a geopolitical actor. I would certainly like to see Europe being much more forceful in international arena as Europe. In, I would like to see the European Union being a really powerful multilateral actor. And you could argue, well, that's geopolitics um, because it's sort of countering China and the United States in a different way. And that certainly is something I strongly favor. But I think within the European Union, there has always been a tension between those who saw the European Union as a way to preserve, if you like, empires, who saw the European Union as a new super state where they could act like they had done in the good old days of empire. Um, I'm thinking of the British and the French particularly, though the British are no longer there. Thank goodness for you, but not for us. And um, I think uh, there's always been a tension between do we need defence in order to protect um, the European Union from enemies, Russia, China, or do we need defence in order to contribute to human security? And that tension exists, and of course it plays out in the arms industries. And I think it's quite a worrying tension which we should all be concerned about. So yes, Europe should, but should be. I think the geopolitics will lead to nowhere. I mean, it could lead to a war in which we would all die, but I don't think that's where it will lead. But it will fail utterly to solve the problems we face. The only way we can solve the problems we face is through a much thicker system of multilateralism and global governance. And if the EU is that kind of an actor, I'd like the EU to be a much more political actor. I'm nervous of the word geopolitical simply because it tends to imply this anarchic, realist world. Uh, where you compete in war terms. But if it just simply means how you shape global regulations, then I'm all in favour of it because I think the EU has not acted sufficiently politically in the past. I forgot to mention Martin's points about China. I think China's really interesting um, because the Chinese regime is much more like an old-fashioned totalitarian regime than it is like one of the new populist authoritarians. And it is acting in very dangerous geopolitical ways. At the same time, the Chinese, and this has worried me quite a lot, uh, I was in China and they want, translated one of my books, and they have a vision. They like the term human security, paradoxically. But for them, it means peacekeeping plus, it means defending their Belt and Road initiatives. They mean, it means creating the kind of stabilization that you need uh, in order to invest worldwide. Um, and it has nothing to do with freedom or human rights, although the Chinese would say they do believe in human rights, but it's economic and social rights rather than political and civil rights, which I feel is a nonsense. Um, so for them, human security is peacekeeping plus infrastructure. And one of the ways I've kind of thought about human security is in a globalized world, human security is about the inside moving outwards. 
Now, we like to think of the inside of our countries, uh, rights-based, law-based societies, that we want a global rule of law and respect for human rights. But in a way, China's arguing the same thing, but it's a Chinese inside. Their human security is a kind of Chinese inside and could be repressive, maybe stable, but awful for many people. So I think it's really interesting to think about what China's, where China's going and what it's trying to do. Well, thank you very much, um, Professor Calder. It's been uh, it's been very interesting. Um, also, uh, to have the opportunity to bring some CDOP and, and eBay voices to 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 the discussion, um, I think this is uh, this is something that will certainly be uh, be still discussed because I think we are uh, back where we were also in discussions on human security when the whole paradigm uh, merged with with force and 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 with uh, with a lot of the emphasis and it was the idea that the principles um, were pointing in the right direction uh, the politics of it and the capacity to to do so were were more difficult to follow. So, and I think that the, the pandemic has also accelerated that idea that uh, that probably human security is what we all care about. Uh, but at the same time, it's uh, being increasingly di difficult to be mobilized politically, both at the internal international and the internal level, um, on many occasions because precisely states have um, in many places failed to act as 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 uh, as desired. But there's no replacement for their action. So, so this is a bit where we are. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have the opportunity to discuss and update uh, ourselves on the on the concept of human security. Uh, and it's been also a pleasure to collaborate uh, jointly with eBay on this session. So on this note, uh, we will leave it here. Thank you very much, Mary. Thank you very much, Paul and Martin. And thank you very much, Jacinth, of course, for uh, the for the for the occasion to organize this. I hope this will be only one of many events to follow. So stay tuned in our uh, websites, ebay.org and cdop.org for uh, updates on, on events. Thank you very much.